Hey there, stackers. Welcome back to our last week of the decade. I'm Joe Salci. Hi, I average Joe Money on Twitter and across the tar- t- 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 table. Couldn't get that word out. It's Mr. Too many OG. this week. <laughs> I swear. It is a rough week. I told Jesse, my coach uh, over at MetPro, that you know what? This week I'm I'm just doing my thing, man. I am I am doing my thing. So leave me alone. <laughs> please. Uh, eggnog for the win. We've got that doesn't have any calories, does it? No. Just the nog part. It feels like you're drinking cake batter. You're doing it wrong. It should feel like you're drinking brandy. <laughs> too much nog. In my... You had a lot. You had way too much <laughs> egg and not enough nog. Yes. Hello. This year is going to be 2015 on the show. This will be episode 286. And we stepped up our game, OG. No offense to Rod Griffin, who you heard yesterday, or Scott Tiris, who you heard uh, representing 2013. But we reached out to CBS business analyst and the host of my favorite money show, Jill on Money, Jill Schlesinger. And Jill said, heck yeah, I remember how this actually went down. I found her on Twitter and I just tweeted to her. And then I found her address on her website and wrote to her address. She didn't answer the email on her website, but she did answer me like two weeks later on Twitter. So at the last second, when we were just about to capitulate and try to find somebody else to take this segment, Jill wrote back to us and said, I'll do it. And this was the first conversation I ever had with somebody I had always really looked up to, Jill Schlesinger. So let's go back. 2015, which we've learned in 2015. So much stuff that we still need to know now. Here we go. All right, here we go. Hold your ears, folks. It's showtime. Live from the world's lamest New Year's party in Joe's mom's basement. I mean, who serves mini weenies anymore? It's the Stacking Benjamin Show. On today's show, we're talking CBS business analyst and host of the hit radio show, Jill on Money, Jill Schlesinger. The top five year-end money tips, the best trivia you've heard all year, and much more. And now, here are two guys in a basement who can't wait for balls to drop, Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. I'm not sure what he's talking about, OG. Unfortunately, yes, you do. Wait, this is the only party that doesn't happen on New Year's Eve. I mean, I think why- the reason that Doug thinks it sucks is because it's the 30th. <laughs> <That's what you're- laughs> and it was hard. Everybody just assumed that the invitations that went out that said, New Year's Eve party in the basement, December 30th. That's why all six, that was a printing error. all six of Mom's Bridge Clubs here and that's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hey, everybody, welcome to another episode of the Stack and Benjamin Show. Just so you know which voice is which, I am Joe Saul Sihai, average Joe Money on Twitter. And across from me, a guy who's not on Twitter, but he does have a Facebook account, the one and only OG. I was told that I have a Facebook account. <laughs> you, do, you don't remember setting it up? I have no recollection of that. <laughs> you can neither confirm nor deny. Correct. Yeah, you know something that you can't deny is that you love going to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. I do money. love going to that. Bam. I just, I just did it again and it's got a whole bunch of money. Isn't that amazing? I, I, I don't know that I saved $450, but I might have dragged the average down a smidge, but I got a way better rate on my checking and savings account. That is awesome. And you know how OG did it? He went to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnified money. And if you have a great credit score and your year on the right note by heading to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash SoFi, that's S-O-F-I. Guess what? Dan at SoFi wrote to me. And you know what he said? He said, why don't we goose this a little? Let's give people $100 that they can use toward their first payment if they want, or they can use it to offset the money that goes toward their first payment. So if you need a loan and you have a high credit score, you can refinance your student loans, of course, your personal loans, or your mortgage through SoFi, and they will give you $100. But here's the deal, OG. It's only $100 if you use this link, stackingbenjamins.com forward slash... SoFi, S-O-F-I. You won't get the 100 bucks just by going to SoFi. Got to use our link. That's for our listeners only. How cool is that, huh? Super cool. Sponsors stepping up to the plate. Magnify Money rocking as usual. SoFi, 
coming out here for the party, giving people a hundred bucks. Go to both of those together, five hundred and fifty dollars. Speaking of saving people money, you know how you learn? You learn from history, right? I mean, what's that quote you always say? History doesn't repeat itself, but but it rhymes. And but, I didn't say that. Oh, you were the second person to say that. I was maybe a smidge more than the second person to say it. The correct answer was Mark Twain. We always like having great people come and revisit the year before to see what we should have learned. And this year might be the biggest ever. Jill Schlesinger, everybody asks what my favorite podcast is on money, and it would have to be Jill on Money. I really like the Jill on Money show, which is actually a radio show that she just turns into a podcast for people. So call in radio show. Jill Schlesinger is, of course, with CBS News, CBS News business analyst. You'll see her all the time on CBS this morning, CBS Sunday morning. Great stuff. Jill Schlesinger coming down to the basement today. How about that, OG? Big time. So she's managed to conquer the radio to podcast. We need help going podcast to radio. That's funny because as we were setting up, talking to Jill and seeing if she could fly by Texarkana to come down to the basement, we actually talked about on her end like it's funny she markets the show they market the radio show but they don't market the podcast at all so she was actually picking our brain why the hell would somebody want to do that that's silly i have no idea but i'll tell you why you pick our brains we got great headlines and those are next let's move hello darlings and now it's time for your favorite part of the show our stacking benjamin's headlines that's maybe the worst segue ever also one thing that we're going to reward people for is if you listen to the show before the end of the year, because we have what, if you listen to the show right when it comes out, you have maybe a day and a half where the market's open still five year end money tips. These come to us from our friends over at the Motley Fool, five ways to improve your personal finances before the end of 2015. And actually, even if you're listening to this in 2016, there's a lot of good advice here. And the first one, of course, they have five different experts on here. And the first piece of advice from an expert is, A smart thing for stock investors to do as the end of the year approaches is to assess your capital gains and losses realized and unrealized. And if you're sitting on a lot of capital gains because you sold the large amount of appreciated stock and taxable accounts, you probably got a hefty tax bill coming your way. You know this piece of advice, OG. Do some accounting now before it's too late. Well, again, you're T minus a day and a half by the time you listen to this, but this is good information for any year. As you get closer to the end of the year, you want to look at what you've done. And if that has resulted in some gains, you might be able to offset that with some positions that are losing money and not have to pay such a hefty tax bill come April. Now, if you're selling stuff that you like and you want to hang on to, you can sell it and buy it back later. But there's this little rule called a wash rule. Explain that. Yeah, you got to wait 31 days before you rebuy it. The best thing to do is to buy something that's very similar to it. So let's say that you had a technology position that has done really, let's say it's done really well and you want to sell that and capitalize on the profit, but you don't want to lose the exposure to that company, you could turn around and buy, let's say, a technology ETF that maybe has a large weighting in that company. Hold it for 30 days and then go back to your original position. Second piece of advice in this article says millions of Americans going through open enrollment at the end of the year. And if you're one of those people that just fly through it, renewing the basic benefits, you might be leaving money on the table. Obviously, we talked about that a few weeks ago with the money guys From another fantastic podcast, by the way, Money Guy Show. I was going to say, I can tell you, when we looked through our open enrollment just, I don't know, four or five weeks ago, there's a section in there that was buried between the health plans and the dental plans and all stuff, and it was called Teladoc. And I found this very interesting. Have you heard about this? No. So Teladoc apparently is one of many companies, I would imagine, that instead of going to the doctor for a cold or the flu or whatever the case may be, you pull them up on Skype. You dial them up, they answer the phone, you say, (coughs) Doc, I got a cold. And apparently there's some rule, and maybe Cheryl would know this a little bit better, but if it's non-narcotic medication, they can prescribe it kind of almost sight unseen. But if it's something more specific, you know, you got to go see your doctor. But most of emergency room visits or most of emergency doctor visits are, hey, I got a chest cold, hey, I got the flu. And of course, now you're at the doctor and you're spreading your germs all over the place. But this is the thing you just pulled up. They look at you and go, what's your temperature, 102? Yeah, you got the flu. Here, let me prescribe you some stuff. It's over at the CVS there in the corner. You never have to leave the house. And it's cheap. It's like 25 bucks. Wow. So it was buried in there. And I said, whoa, wait a second. We got to look at this, Mrs. OG, because, you know, that might save us some money. Do you get your little blue pills that way? You're an ass. 
It's very awkward standing in front of the Skype monitor. <laughs> it's not working. <laughs> Do you have any help? Can you help me with that, Doc? <laughs> and he's like, back away from the camera a little please, bit. Please, really, please, right? <laughs> objects, objects in Skype are larger than they are. <laughs> Next, I didn't mean to derail the conversation. Oh, no, yes, you did. And actually, what I didn't want to do was talk a ton about open enrollment because people can just go back and listen to that awesome episode in November. But you should have told me that before I opened my chair. No, that's fine. I thought that was really cool. What also is cool, though, the people have to know is before the end of the year, we got to talk about flex savings accounts because if you're sitting on money that you put into flex savings accounts, you got to get that stuff spent. Yeah, flexible accounts expire at the end of the year. Yeah, big stuff. Number three on our list from The Motley Fool is making sure that you max out your Roth IRAs or your regular IRAs or whatever the case is. Get that stuff in this year. Can you do that after January 1st? I was going to say this is not imperative to get done before the end of the calendar year. Uh, When does that have to be done by? Your tax filing or April 15th, whichever comes first. Good stuff there. Yeah, it's funny because I would have clients call me on New Year's Eve. And I've already left the office and like, I got to get my contribution in. You're going to be okay. Next one is look at how much you're likely to have an itemized deductions. And then depending on which way you're going to go, maybe decide if you're going to claim your property taxes or pay your property taxes in 2015 or pay them in 2016 if you're on your home. Yeah, this is a great tax advisor question because there's a lot of components to this because then you could fall into some, have some AMT rules or some AMT penalties, I guess, if you have too much of itemized deductions. Good stuff. I'll link to those in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. Our next headline comes to us from Investment News. I found this one interesting. Edward Jones and Blue Leaf are betting that texting is going to be the way to reach young clients. They're among the first to text out text-based mobile communications. And this piece written by Alessandra Melito Leads off, companies are betting on texting as the next wave of popular communication for advisors and their clients, waving off compliance fears for the potential to reach a younger base of clients. It seems that people, millennials, really would rather get a text from people. This is what they're betting on. They'd rather get a text from you than a long, complicated email. I think that the research has shown that most people text now more than talk on the phone. LOL. Which is comical. But it's always been a problem for advisors because all of our communication has to be archived and searchable. This is an example, a little bit of government not being able to keep up with technology. This is arcane rules, not fit for the century, basically. So a lot of companies are scrambling on this. The reality is, is that I'm sure plenty of advisors text their clients. And I'm sure that the government oversight committees understand that that happens, but they can't archive it. We had a group a couple of years ago that was exploring this for our firm. And the best they could come up with, which I'd be interested to see how Edward Jones ends up doing it. The best they could come up with was you installed a program on your smartphone and then it archived all of your texts. Every text. Yeah. Well, (laughs) there are some texts that don't need to be archived. (laughs) Searchable. (laughs) Let me put it that way. (laughs) And I think uniformly when they announced this program, uniformly people are like, wait a second, all my texts get archived? Huh? What? Like even the ones that, no one's supposed to see, but the person I'm sending them to. <laughs> Mrs. OG? Yeah. Like, nope. <laughs> Guess I'm not going to sign up for that program <laughs> because that's how it works with email. You know, we have our emails that's archived. You can't select, pick and choose which email gets, you know. This is the tough thing, though. I mean, you know, if you're somebody who spends a lot of time online and you're reading online, there are some advisors who are online often and talking about stuff online, but the vast majority of advisors, and there's some great advisors out there, OG, you never hear from because of the fact that they're afraid of their compliance department. Oh, it's ridiculous. It's so obnoxious, the amount of oversight, and it's not oversight in a good manner, the amount of just the nitpicky hoops that people have to jump through to even do something as simple as write a blog post. There's many a professional finance blogger who has written about how they just said, I'm not going to be licensed by you guys anymore, so I can write whatever the heck I want. Jeff Rose comes to mind. He wrote a big piece probably about a year and a half ago or two years ago on his blog, Good Financial Sense, where he said, here's why I got rid of my licenses. And the crux of it was it took so long to get his stuff approved 
by the company that had to approve it that it became stale. You know, and we know like from this type of stuff, I mean, if you've got to have a tweet that's pre-approved, it's not really a tweet anymore, you know. The whole idea is instantaneous communication. If you have to wait 48 hours for it to be approved, like, you know. Right. It kind of loses its punch. You're you know? commenting on the Super Bowl or something that comes out two days after the Super Bowl. Yeah, that's wild. Can you believe he didn't run it with Marshawn Lynch? People are like, <laughs> did you just watch that? What are you talking about? That was you like, TiVo that? It's like last week, man. So, yeah, in a manner of speaking. Uh, yes. I think the lessons here from our headlines, number one is, if you're listening to this before the end of 2015, take a nice solid look back before you're unable to. 2016, if you're somebody that has missed the boat on last year, well, write yourself a nice little note the week before New Year's 2016 to do a better job. Man, I'm excited about this guest. I'm excited about so many guests we have on the show, OG, but Jill Schlesinger upstairs talking to mom, getting ready to come down to the basement. Is mom being nice, do you think? Man, I hope so, because Jill... She does kind of overdo it. You know, sometimes we're like, no, this is really important. She'll go, I'll make some nice jello. Like, I don't think jello is appropriate. Like, no, no, everybody likes orange jello with the little oranges in them. Yeah, with little pieces in it. What's that all yeah. about? It's fantastic. Oh, you don't like orange jello with mandarin oranges? <laughs> with little oranges in communist? it? I must be. <laughs> Jill Schlesinger is the host of a fantastic radio show that simulcast over... 90 different stations around the United States and elsewhere. The show's called Jill on Money. It's also turned into a podcast where that you can get everywhere. Of course, you've seen Jill on CBS This Morning, CBS Sunday Morning, and the CBS News because she's a CBS contributor and their business analyst. Let's say hello to Jill Schlesinger coming down to the basement. Jill Schlesinger joins us in the basement. Welcome, Jill. I mean, the basement, dude. This is like a throwback for me. You don't know how old I am, but <laughs> like things that happened in the basement stayed in the basement. You know what I mean? Some REO Speedwagon played in the background. I think that's ambitious <laughs> when you think about that that's how old I am because it might have been more like Billy Joel the Stranger. Oh, wow. See, now you dated yourself. I did nothing yeah. to do with that. All right. All right so I'm an old fart. I'll take it. Well, I got to ask you this. Were you always good with money? Because like when I listen to the show and I take you on my long runs and I'm listening to Jill on money, I just think you wield these questions like a ninja, Jill. So has that always been you or was that kind of learned later in life? You know, my first job on Wall Street, I was a trader. So if you asked me like within the first five years of graduating college, if you asked me any financial question, the personal finance question, I wouldn't know the answer. But if you asked me how to explain the Black-Scholes model and how to trade gold and silver and copper options, I could have given you a great dissertation. So what helped me is that I'm actually someone who practiced. I was an investment advisor and I'm a CFP. So I did it for a long time. And as you know, with most of these issues, it's not like there's that much difference, right? We get the same kinds of questions over and over. And as a result, you get good at answering them you know, with a few different twists. It's always fun to talk to people because every single person has a slightly different financial story. Right. That's the fun of it because the questions are always the same. I think Tess Viglin said that there's only really like six questions. They're all your particular how you skew those six. That's exactly right. And it's also, you know, you've got a viewpoint. You know, I love Tess. She's a very good friend of mine. And one of the things that we've always actually had a fight about is that she's the kind of person who's sort of like, you know, why would anyone actually need a financial advisor? Now, I love Tess. And this was something that was like sort of objectionable to me. I said, what do you mean? Like, you don't understand, Tess. I used to talk to people and they were their own worst enemies. Like, if they didn't have someone to help them, they would have actually just completely screwed themselves over. So sometimes, you know, the advisor, I know it's not a great community all the time. We certainly get a bunch of people who obfuscate a little bit, but by and large, it's a group of professionals who do want to help their clients and many people need that help. I just think my wealthiest clients, whether it was financial advisor, different type of advisor, they had great advisors around them. That was what always stuck with me when I saw people that had millions and millions of dollars. It was always partly because they surrounded themselves with good people. Yeah. And, you know, 
look, you've got to have good people. You've got to have resources. And no one person has all the answers. So that's why it's nice to have a team approach. And it's certainly great if you're building your own financial team to think about, well, you know, I've got somebody who helps me manage my money, do financial planning. I've got a great estate attorney. I have a wonderful CPA. And all of those pieces are part of your financial future. And they need to come together in a way that you feel comfortable with it. Like if you can do it all yourself, fantastic. But in my experience, people are very busy, they're overwhelmed, and this is emotional stuff. And so, frankly, the emotions are the things that always will lead us astray. You say that no person has all the answers, and I was pretty sure until that moment that Jill Schlesinger had all the answers. So I'm very disappointed. Yeah, well, you know, I hate to disappoint you. It's a great (laughs) disappointment in life. But even I, there's so many times on the show where I'll get someone who asks me a question. I say, you know, I don't know that. I realize I'll, I'll find out for you, but I don't know that. And some of the very technical questions, even about Social Security or someone's collecting SSDI as Social Security Disability and how should they do it, I'm not sure that the intricacies of those systems are readily available to any financial advisor. If someone specializes in it, sure. But most of us, well, we didn't know all of that. We'd have to go find it out for our clients. I think that's also the upside of a good advisor is they just know where to look, right? Not that they'll have every answer, but they know where to look. Absolutely. You were nice enough to be our last guest in 2015. Fantastic. Thank you for doing this. You have the five big themes of 2015. And I thought, if you don't mind, We'll walk through these, Jill, and let's just do a replay of 2015. All right. So the first one you have here is not event slash event China. Tell us about China in 2015. You know, China has been probably on my top list for the last, I don't know, 10 years and always with a slightly different permutation. We walked into this year and there were a lot of economists that I was interviewing for CBS and really finding that they were a little worried about what was going on in China. They said, you know, it's growing so fast and what's going to happen is they're going to have what's called a hard landing, meaning that they can't grow as fast as they're growing. Things are going to downshift and when they slow down, it's not going to be a gentle tap on the brake. It's going to be jamming on the brake, skidding and bad things are going to happen. So what did happen this year is that China's stock market began a massive bull market in the middle of 2014 and then peaked sometime earlier this year. And in fact, I think back in June, the Shanghai Composite was up like 160% from the prior year. It's a huge year, right? Wow. And Chinese officials got really freaked out about that because what they had done is they'd said to all the people, they're like, you know, it's really great. You should buy stocks. And when the Chinese government does it, it's not like Uncle Sam saying, you know, bye, 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 bonds. Now I'm also dating myself. It feels like a real important message to the people of China. And so they did buy stocks, but the officials got nervous and they tried to prick that stock market bubble. They changed some of the rules. The index just collapsed something, you know, 30, 40 percent, still down. And at that point, that was sort of the end of July, the beginning of August. All of a sudden, people in the U.S. started looking over and saying, what's going on in China? And growth there had slowed down. They're no longer growing at 10, 11, 12 percent a year. That said, their economy is huge. It's the second largest economy in the world. And maybe they're growing at more like five or six percent this year. But so far, although things have slowed down in China, there has not been a disaster. And there certainly has not been a hard landing. So it's sort of like a big theme. But the worst did not occur. As you know, somebody in the news, Jill, and I'm sure you watch CNBC a little bit and the financial news networks, and this was all over the place. And it just makes me think of Carl Richards talking about this being financial pornography. And to what a degree should we pay attention to things like this? Because you couldn't get away from it in July. But if I'm average person with, you know, nine to five job and a 401k, is this something I need to be aware of? Or is this something to what degree should I pay attention? Look, I mean, it depends whether you're a news junkie or not. The funny thing is about the Chinese stock market is that it's a closed market. So foreigners could not invest in that market. What was interesting and what may have been pertinent to average investors is this concept that as an economy gets bigger and bigger, its pace of growth cannot increase at the same rate as it did when it was a fraction of the size. And what is the message there? The message is that, you know, even in the United States, we talk about, oh, growth stinks. It's terrible here. But you know what? We're a huge economy. So even if we're growing at two and a quarter or two and a half percent a year, it's not bad. 
So I think the most important part of the China story is really about whether or not the slowdown in China was going to portend a worldwide slowdown. In some areas, it really did. I mean, the fact that China was slowing down meant that the demand for crude oil wasn't as strong as many people thought it would be at the beginning of 2015. I think what I hear you saying, we should pay attention to the news. So when we look at our 401k statement, we at least have some idea why the heck it went down a little. Yeah. And also to understand, I mean, I guess if you don't understand context, then you're likely to be more swayed by your emotions, you know, and so you've got to have context like, hey, this Chinese market's going down. Okay, what does that really mean for me? Well, maybe this is something, maybe growth is slowing down. How does that affect me? And I think the most direct effect that you can see in the Chinese story of the world is really seen in oil, which is also one of my themes for the year. Let's get there in a second. But before we get there, I got to ask you this, Jill. It was Frankie Valley, or Frankie Avalon who said Greece is the word. You know, it's got mood. It's got feeling, right? Greece yeah. is the time, a place. I don't know which one it was, but Greece was the word in 2015. First of all, the fact that you don't know that Greece, that was from the movie Greece. I know. There's a Broadway show that came before <laughs> it. That's the new Greece. Okay. Is that Frankie Valley? It is Frankie Valley. Oh. Okay, very well done. Do you know how many segments I did on CBS This Morning and CBS Evening News about Greece? I felt like 100. I bet you I want to kept, poke your eyes out. I felt like we have a guy who's on the ground in Greece that I was laughing because we would be talking all the time. And he'd be telling me what's going on. I said, this is impossible. It can't be this. Like, this is not happening again. And it was a very strange situation because Greece had an election. Their new prime minister came into power early this year and basically said to the people of Greece, you know what? That deal that we cut with the Europeans to bail us out was a stinker. And I am not going to agree to cut every single thing. I'm not going to agree to pension reform. I'm not going to agree to it. And we're going to put some of the old stuff back in place, which he did. And the Europeans got piping hot mad and they were really mad. And there was a point where this came to a head, which was around a big debt that was due, a loan that was going to need to be rolled over. And at that moment, it was really wild. There was even a referendum. Should we do this? Should we not do this? And at the end of the day, if you kind of went to sleep on March 30th and you woke up on August 30th, you would have said, oh, Greece rolled over their loans. No big deal. But in between, it was so volatile. It was crazy. There was a new three-year bailout package. And Greece literally came within hours of being pushed out of the Eurozone. It would have been the first country ever to have defaulted, would have been the biggest default. And it would have been a bit of a cataclysmic uh, problem for all of Europe. And if you look to kind of who the people were who held the reins there, it's all about the Germans and Angela Merkel. And she was tough. And at the end of the day, the whole Greek government basically was brought to his knees by the Germans. And they agreed to all the horrible things they said they never agreed to. I obviously don't have a crystal ball, but are there more dominoes still to fall there? You know, it's funny. I interviewed Mohammed El Aryan. He's a very big economist at Allianz. And One of the things that he talked about was that in every deal that Greece makes, what's happening is that all the powers that be are kicking the can down the road, that we have not solved the problem of Greece because the problem is very easily fixed. Here's what happens. The people in Europe say, oh, there's no way they're ever going to pay us back this money. You know, they owe us $50 billion. Eh, Let's call it $10 billion and we hope we get that back. There's been no admission that the deals that have been cut are silly deals, that Greece is never going to pay back all the money it owes, and that most likely the best path for Greece and the Eurozone is to come together, probably when the Eurozone's a little stronger, and figure out a way to gently nudge Greece out of the Eurozone, have Greece go back to its own currency, and try to work its way out. It's hard to work your way out of a big debt overload when you can't just walk away from it And you can't devalue your currency because your currency is the euro. I'm disappointed just that trips to Greece haven't been less expensive because of that. Because I totally agree with you. (laughs) I have been waiting to go to Greece. I went to Turkey this year. What a deal. 30% appreciation in the dollar versus the Turkish lira. Man, did I live large in Turkey. But can't do it in Greece because they're part of the euro. 
Yeah, that's crazy. So we got to get them out of there right. just for selfish reasons. It has nothing yeah, to do with it. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, you could get like maybe you say, oh, well, Mykonos could be sponsored by something. <laughs> like, oh, you know, like someone should buy Mykonos. It would be great. What does this say about, let's get back to the average investor. You know, you talk about places like Greece or even in past years, we've talked about Asia. We've talked about a lot of these emerging economies out there. If somebody's buying emerging markets because they think it's hot, I think this is a testament again that it is hot, Jill, but it's quite a roller coaster ride that you're getting into. Yeah. I mean, if you're buying emerging markets, you've got to be in it for the long term. You have to understand that it's going to be volatile. And you have to also really be clear that I mean, when they tear off on the upside, it's fantastic. But you also have to know that if it represents too large a portion of your overall portfolio, you can get shaken out of a great asset class. So I'm not saying that emerging markets are going to be back on their feet and fabulous next year. There's a lot of issues. And each of the markets is somewhat different. You remember that whole idea of the BRIC nations? Right. Brazil, Russia, India, China, that was coined by a Goldman Sachs guy. They're all very different. We've lumped them together for a while. They seem to move in tandem, but they're very different countries with very different issues. So even though we might own an an emerging markets index, each country in that index is going through something very specific. And what's going to affect them going forward is the fact that we've got this change in how interest rates are going to be handled across the globe. And there's going to be great divergence within the emerging markets and also between various of developed markets. So these different markets, instead of everything looking, looking in lockstep, like everything's going up, everything's going down, things are going to start to change a little bit. I think your asset allocation is going to be really important in the next group of years. Okay, but you know these people, Jill. You've had these people that have called you and talked about gold, right? We have people writing to us all the time saying, we don't give gold any love. And then I roll my eyes. Is this... uh I don't know. What do you think about gold? Well, first of all, my first job on Wall Street, I was a gold trader. Were you? Yeah, that was my first job. So ready for another dating of self to the 80s? (laughs) You remember the movie Trading Places? Yes, right. Mortimer, I was a trader on that floor. That was my first job. I was a trader in gold, silver, and copper options pits. So I love the metals, and that's really where I grew up on Wall Street. That said... You know, look, it's hard to make an argument for gold because when I was coming up on Wall Street, gold represented something very different. There weren't as many ways to be defensive about your portfolio. The way I think about gold today is it's a bit of disaster insurance. You know, like you buy a big policy and you say, if the worst were to happen, I want to have a liability umbrella policy of $5 million, you know, just in case something horrible happens in my house and you hope you never need it. I think that that's how you should be thinking about gold, that if you believe that it's somewhat of an asset class that represents the bet on disaster occurring, then you have some portion of your portfolio that would be allocated to gold or to a gold ETF, and then you do it. Honestly, I'm an old gold trader. I haven't owned gold for such a long time because I think there's other ways to get really smart and defensive amid volatile markets. I think that's another trip down to the basement, Jill, because that sounds like a whole episode on its own. Yeah, on, sure. On I, that note, by the way, how come we don't have Jill Schlesinger's book yet? When's the book? Oh, <laughs> dude, you know what? I feel like you're my mother right now. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> should be asking, how come Jill Schlesinger, out of all people, haven't written a book yet? So Jill Schlesinger has a book agent who also is asking that exact question because <laughs> there have been four proposals of the. So I have a book that's in the works. I'm hopeful that I will finish my proposal in the coming weeks. And hopefully, hopefully when I have a book to shill, I'll come back down to the basement. Maybe we'll sit on the books. So we get very (laughs) tall and feel our, yeah. So my biggest issue about financial books is that they are incredibly boring. Yeah. Right. So I think they come in two flavors, incredibly boring or so stupid. Right. Oh my God. Like I don't need a finger wagging nincompoop to tell me not to, you know, oh, do, do, try to spend less than you make. Oh, thank you. I mean, it's like, come on, who doesn't know that? So I uh, wanted to be able to write a book that is funny and smart and could kind of make fun of all of us and how we're such crazy idiots when it comes to money. Oh, that's great. I can't wait. Well, I love your analogy about disaster insurance with gold. So let's keep the theme of natural resources here. You mentioned oil. Let's get back there. 46% plunge in oil prices last year. Yeah. I mean, I got to tell you something. So 2014, we dropped down. The beginning of this year, we get to like 60 bucks a barrel. But 
that whole idea about China slowing down really affected the calculus. Look, remember Econ 101, there's really only two sides to the equation. It's supply and demand. So on one side, we knew that demand was starting to wane a little bit. And specifically in China, that's where we saw it most specifically. Why is that, by the way? Because if we keep hearing about an emerging middle class in China, more people getting cars, I think the need for oil is higher. And yet I continually hear that demand in China is down. Can you shine a light on that at all? Sure. I mean, so part of the problem for China is that they've had this economy that has been beefed up from the investment side. So the government in China would say, okay, we're building a new city and spend a bunch of money to build a new city, buy the resources necessary, and they would do it. And what they're trying to do is to create more of a consumer-based economy, which is a real challenge. I mean, 50 years ago, we're not done moving from an agrarian economy into an information age economy in China. So developing a middle class is happening and the numbers are huge, But it's not happening at the pace that everybody thought it was going to happen. And there is something about the fact that these folks are not consumptive. And they some of them are. Yes, if you've ever been to Beijing, you'll say like, oh, my God, I've never seen so many Louis Vuitton stores in my life. (laughs) But not everybody and not enough of them. So we had on one side on the oil equation, demand was a little bit soft. But then here's what else we had. When demand was soft, what would normally happen is – OPEC would say, oh, okay, we'll just cut back production, right? We won't have as much oil available. Sure. Sweet, right? Price would go up. But nobody is cutting back on production. So OPEC is not cutting back on production. Russia is not cutting back on production. U.S. shale folks are not cutting back on production because no one wants to be the person or the entity that basically says, oh, we'll cut back on production, and then your customer goes to one of your competitors. So they don't Uh. want to lose market share. No one's cutting back on production. And lo and behold, we get oil under 40 bucks a barrel. It is unbelievable to me. And in fact, I think maybe the big story as it translates here in the U.S. is every single economist I spoke to at the beginning of 2015 is like, okay, oil's down, consumer's going to spend more money. Hasn't exactly come out that way. Consumers here in the U.S. are saving money at the pumps and certainly coming into the end of the year is pretty awesome. That said, there's not widespread spending. There's spending on large ticket items, which is great, cars, houses, big appliances. But if you ask the major retailers, they're not saying that there's huge spending going on. So the spending is happening in pockets and that money that's saved at the pumps has not been recycled back into the U.S. economy in a broad-based way just yet. It sounds like what you're saying, the price of oil, I mean, once again, no crystal ball, but it should stay low. I don't see a huge reason for it to rise. On the other hand, uh, in the parlance of a trader, it's like, to me, oil gets a little oversold in these times, right? So they're going to overshoot. You know, markets don't just stop at the bottom like, ah, equilibrium, we're done, let's move on. It doesn't usually happen that way. So I think that oil could stay low. Someone asked me the beginning of this year, like, what do you think is the the price of oil? Like, I kind of thought we'd end up at somewhere between 45 and 55. I am surprised we're sub 40, but I'm not shocked. And I don't necessarily see a huge impetus for oil to go from 40 to 60 anytime soon. So could we stay in a range? Sure. But again, it's not going to be a static market. Commodities is a game of winners and losers, right? It's a zero sum game, unlike the stock market, right? So someone's winning, someone's losing. And if enough of these small drillers go out of business or some small frackers say, I can't pay my money back to my bondholders, the business is going to change and the economy is not standing still either. So if the U.S. economy continues to grow, if China kind of gets back on its feet, Japan does okay, Europe is a zero plus, the demand will side will increase and the supply side will kind of stay where it is. I love your radio show, Jill on Money, which is on 96 stations. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, that's crazy. And, of course, I always listen to it on the podcast, so I take it with me, just Jill on Money. You can get it on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you listen to anything. And it is a simulcast of the radio show, right? I mean, you just take listener questions. Yeah, and we've got guests, and we do some fun stuff with that. But, you know, it's a very classic model of a call-in show. So if people have a question, they send us an email, they call, we get them on the air, we answer questions. And, you know, we try not to make this rocket science because it's not. It's just your money, and I know it can be a little freaky, but 
most times, if you get a little bit of rational thought behind it, we'll get to the bottom. We'll get to the answer for you. <laughs> you certainly do. What's the one thing looking forward now? Thank you for looking back with us, by the way, Jill. But what's the one thing savers really need to pay attention to in 2016? Well, look, the story of 2016 is going to be about the Fed. That There's no doubt in my mind. I called 2015 the year of the raise, and it has turned out to be that, which I think is great. People are making a little bit more money. The job situation has improved. We have end up creating two and a half to three million jobs this year. It'll be great. But I think that we've never been in a situation, just to put this, you know, kind of like some context here. The Fed kept put interest rates at zero to a quarter of a percent in December of 2008. Okay, at that time, in the fourth quarter of 2008, the economy was shrinking by an 8% annualized pace. We were losing hundreds of thousands of jobs a month, you know, I think 700,000 jobs or so in the month of December of 2008. We're in a very different place right now. The economy is certainly stronger than it was. It's not awesome, but it's stronger, and we're on our feet. So the Fed, as it starts to change interest rates and normalize policy, in my mind, the story is that things rarely go smoothly when it comes to rate cycle changes, meaning that the Fed has either been consistently late or they've been consistently early. They rarely get it spot on. So I think that the surprise in 2016 could be that hey, you know what? The Fed's not doing exactly what we thought they were going to do. Right now, the bond market is predicting that the Fed will increase short-term interest rates by a quarter of a percent every other meeting for the next three years. I just don't think that's going to be the way it goes. It's just not how the economy works. You have a rotten quarter. You have a great quarter. You have inflation that's basically been dormant for you know seven years. All of a sudden, it's going to bubble up and everyone's going to be like, oh, my God, there's inflation. It's scary. And then the Fed's going to go faster. So I think the good news is that nobody knows the answer to this, that I don't care who your expert of choice is. There is no person who understands because Janet Yellen herself has said to us, I don't know what it's going to be. It's going to be data dependent. That said, I think that for us, we should know that this could be kind of a volatile time. We've never gone for this long with rates this low. In fact, it's more than nine years since the Fed last raised interest rates. That's the longest stretch in 25 years. So we have not been in this place before. So for anyone to try to predict exactly what's going to happen, I think it's a fool's game. The best thing you can do as an investor is to stick to your game plan. Don't get shaken out. Stay with it. Have your asset allocation. Do your rebalancing. Don't get cute. Don't try to guess the top of the bottom because you're not going to do it because not even the really smart people do it. And yeah, there are a few outliers who say, oh, you know, I deliver alpha to my clients. Yeah. Okay. Fine. <laughs> yeah, you do for a quarter or for, but you know, someone said to me like, what makes Warren Buffett such a great investor? Well, one of the things that makes him such a great investor is that he's got an infinite time horizon. He just doesn't have to worry about that, you know? And so that's a huge advantage. If we had the kind of mindset where we say, we're just not going to mess around with this. We're sticking with our game plan. And that's what the game plan is going to be. We'd be far better off. Hi, everyone. It's Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Seriously, what kind of New Year's party is this? Why is the punch bowl shaped like a bucket in the corner of the room? And where are the cups? Anyway, I got the best trivia question you've heard all year. You ready for this? The S&P 500 single best annual return was 45.02%. But what year was it? It's a toughie, so I'll give you a few hints. The number one hit song from that year was Little Things Mean a Lot by Kitty Kalin. And the movie that won the Oscar for Best Picture was From Here to Eternity. I'll be back in a bit after I stick my head in that punch bucket. Hey, stackers, it's time in the show for us to help you solve your money problems. First of all, if you're somebody with a bunch of credit card debt, you've got to change that behavior. Let's work on changing it. The first thing we have to do is get open. And we asked Nick Clement, the CEO of Magnify Money, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money to reach them. Why people don't talk about their credit card debt. I know. I wish we would. If, you know, if you remember when you're in school and you look left and you look right, and one of these people right. will. Well, one of these people will have credit card debt and, and, it, and, it, and probably will be you. 
at some point in your life. And because we don't talk about it, because we're so ashamed, we're so embarrassed, what we end up doing is nothing. We stay put. We don't come up with a plan to get out of it. We don't negotiate better deals and refinance. And so it just becomes this, this horrible, quiet problem that, that, that can make someone feel awful. You shouldn't be ashamed. Almost you know, one out of two people have it. Speak up. And only when you talk about it and deal with it can you get out of the problem. So, of course, we don't talk about it. But you know what? If you don't hold yourself accountable, you'll get nowhere. Then once you decide that it's time to make things better, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money for not just better credit card options with 0% interest rates to help surf your debt to lower rate, but also for better savings accounts and checking accounts. And if the change you're trying to create in your life is to buy a new home, And you've got a high credit score. Guess where you should go? StackingBenjamins.com forward slash SoFi. That's S-O-F-I. And as we've talked about before, you go to SoFi because of their incredibly low rates and their easy system of getting approved for loans. You'll know in most cases within 10 minutes. But we asked Dan Macklin exactly what types of loans they have on mortgages. SoFi offers a a 30-year fixed and a 15-year fixed and a a 7-1 adjustable rate mortgage. The the key difference with our mortgages is we require as little as 10% down payment on those mortgages. So you may only have 10% of the purchase price and that that can be good enough for SoFi. And importantly, we don't charge any mortgage insurance. So for many people who haven't yet saved up a huge down payment, we're a great option. Stackingbenjamins.com forward slash SoFi, S-O-F-I. When your change in your life is either a new house, refinancing student loans, or taking out a personal loan to get rid of debt. (laughs) Oh man, Joe's mom's neighbor Doug here. Let me tell you something. Do not stick your head in that punch bucket. It tastes like water squeezed out of a mop and left out for a year. Nasty. Anyway, now back to our trivia question. The S&P 500 had a whopping 45.02% rate of return in what year? Well, that would be 1954, almost 62 years ago. Man, you forget all that stuff. It's so funny. After China and the big market downturn, I forgot Greece even happened in 2015. That that whole blow up occurred this year. What's happened so many times, you know, what, two or three times Greece has been in the headlines over the last five or six years for something major. I kind of agree with her a little bit. Like you've got to have some contextual information for what's happening in the world, so to speak. What's kind of might be some driving forces. I think the big piece you have to remember is, is that it doesn't matter. None of the day-to-day news matters. And the frustrating thing I think for clients is that they kind of get that first but then they see it like beat into their skulls every day. Like, this is the newest thing. This is the newest thing. What you mean is, I think, let me see if this is what you mean, is that you shouldn't act on every piece of data. Like all these five things Jill talked about, you didn't need to act on every single one of these. You didn't yeah, need to cool. act on any of them. There's a great quote that I heard. Well, I wish I knew who said it because I could give him credit. But it says, great investors don't react. Great investors act. And when clients call, sometimes they call and say, oh my gosh, did you hear that thing about Greece? How should we react to that? And my response is always, we shouldn't do anything because our plan is based on 30 years of projections, you know, or 30 years of time. We've made a plan. We have acted. That is our plan. And every year we've got a process and a methodology for revisiting the plan and adjusting the sales, so to speak, to take advantage of whatever winds are on the ocean that day, you know. But we're not going to bounce around because the Chinese currency may or may not be included in this arbitrary basket of currencies for the first time ever or not, or the U.S. sold warplanes to Taiwan and that means this. Who cares? Yeah, it's funny. Big thanks to Jill Schlesinger for coming down and reviewing the year. It was a very tumultuous year, and I think it was definitely a year where Sticking to your guns was a better way to go. Let's get into the letter bag because, man, we are just about caught up. So if you've got a note for us, Joe at stackingbenjamins.com. Remember, you go to the front of the line if you go to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. Leave us a voicemail and we will play that. This first note comes from Lenny. Lenny is a guy that wrote to us before, said he heard the shout out to him on that day's show, which was awesome. 
He said he'll keep sending us links that might be up our alley. He sent us one in the past, and he said feel free to tell him to buzz off anytime we get too annoying. Buzz off. <laughs> but he says, speaking of that, he is wanted to hear what we had to say about an article that showed up in USA Today. And he said before he gets our reaction, he knows how much OG hates talking about macro stuff. But he's fascinated with the continuing 2008 recession fallout that's still happening now. He also wonders, by the way, oh, what we think about the movie Big Short. And as the time that we've taped this, neither one of us had a chance to see it. But we'll start there, OG. I think we're both excited to see the Big Short. Yeah, I read an article on the Wall Street Journal about how it didn't exactly happen that way or something like that. And I just thought, well, of course it didn't. It's a movie. Right. It didn't happen exactly that same way. Because the way it happened probably wasn't movie material. Yeah. But Michael Lewis has a way of taking a story and turning it into a great story and turning that into a great movie. So I am looking forward to seeing it. So yeah. excited. But this article from the USA Today that Len wanted us to talk about is the Fed officially ends too big to fail lending from Nathan Bami. The Federal Reserve on Monday, this is the first week of December, by the way, so this is now a month old, adopted a rule that would limit emergency loans to failing companies, formalizing a policy that was central to congressional reform efforts in the wake of the global financial crisis of 2008. The rule narrows the Fed's ability to intervene to prevent companies that are supposedly too big to fail from collapsing. We generally do, Len, stay away from macro stuff, but OG, any comments about that? No, not really. No comments. I just have one, just as a guy who is a capitalist, I mean, let the capitalist system work. So at the time, I thought banks should be allowed to fail. I know that we had Fed Chairwoman Sheila Baer on the show, of course, this year, and she was one of the people instrumental to setting that up. But to the degree that one company should be allowed to fail and another shouldn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Well, you run into that, you know, favoritism thing, right? Why was Bear Stearns let kind of slowly take itself apart but Lehman was allowed to shutter its doors that day and Citibank was allowed to get a whole bunch of money right you know it's just yeah it just kind of reeks of favoritism right yeah totally Mm -hmm. yeah so I say let them all burn (laughs) I think it's about all OG and I have on that topic so Lenny thanks a lot for another note to the show next letter comes to us from Jason Jason said Hey, Joe, a friend visited my wife and I this evening to discuss some things. We weren't really too sure what she wanted to visit for, but we obliged. She brought a, in quotes, friend with her. I soon found out this was a pitch for Primerica, which she recently became involved in. She talked about giving us a free plan and also using it as a business opportunity for my stay-at-home wife. Is it just me or does Primerica seem like a Ponzi scheme slash pyramid scheme to you also? I think she was shocked that I was more well-versed in finance than she was. Thanks mostly to my favorite podcast, Stocking Benjamins. Oh, yeah. Roll, Tide, Roll. Uh, Jason had me until Roll, Tide, Roll. Jason, we'll start off our answer with Go Green, by the way. We'll start there. and We'll move on after that. So do you want to start with, let's talk about, why don't we talk about, Direct marketing first and what we think about, not just Primerica, but about direct marketing. Do you want to go first there or do you want me to take that? So I'll give you just a couple of background that I have. I've never had a great experience with it. And I know that there are companies that do very well and provide a lot of value in different areas. But I think that there's more opportunity for dysfunction in that type of business model than in any other type. Because... Truly, the people at the top probably are making ridiculous amounts of money. But to get there, I don't think they're really genuine in how much work and activity and luck and all that other sort of stuff plays into getting to their position. You know, I mean, when you were hired at American Express, I'm sure that there were people who said, oh, being a financial advisor is easy. You know, you just advise people on money. And then there's probably somebody who took you aside. Well, you've told the story. Now somebody takes you aside and goes, no, no, this is going to be the worst three years of your life. Right. You want to build a business? It's going to take tons of work. And I think that direct marketing or MLM or whatever you want to call it, I think people are either afraid that they'll get turned down on the opportunity, turned down to be involved in the opportunity by somebody they're pitching it to if they kind of show all the true colors. You know what I mean? So they kind of show the rosy things. Yeah, I think that there are definitely some companies with great products that use multi-level marketing as well as their way of doing business. I don't think it's a pyramid scheme. I mean, it certainly has a pyramidish structure, right? But any sales organization has a pyramidish structure. 
the issue that I have, if somebody is considering this, I think you can make a lot of money. Like you said, OG, you can make a lot of money. But I think that a lot of times it's misrepresented, which is whenever any type of a job has a low barrier of entry, meaning, do you know what the cost is to create a McDonald's franchise? One million dollars. Yeah, it's a ton of money, right? And because of that, if you open a McDonald's franchise, you're not going to have a lot of people. I mean, you're going to have some people that drive down the street and go, I don't think I'm going to stop. But you don't have this Barry Venture people like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? Why are you trying to sell me hamburgers? You know what I mean? Everybody knows what they're selling. And because of that, because of that. Well, barrier- the people who franchise that McDonald's aren't buffoons either, generally. Right. Because right. they got to write a check for a million bucks or whatever the VIG is now. Yeah, they already and know. they probably have to buy more than one. I was looking at Panera franchises when, you know, 10, 15 years ago when Panera was first out. I was like, oh, this is going to be hot. I can tell. And to get the rights to an area, you had to commit to opening like four of them in that whatever your territory was. Yeah, you're not each, messing around. Each one was $400,000. Right, right. I'm like, holy crow. But you think, okay, so somebody just wrote a check for $1.6 million. These guys aren't dummies. Because yeah. that's not one point. That's not all their money. Right. That's some of their money. The you barrier know? to entry of those businesses is very high. And because of that, you don't have a lot of rejection. But when the barrier to entry is really low, like it is for MLM, you have a lot of competition, which means you're going to get turned down a lot by people. So you have to have uh, very thick skin to work in that market to make sure that you're able to get your message across. Because like you said, OG, there's so many buffoons that you're working against. There's idiots. The biggest, most idiotic thing that I see in MLM is partly what you were talking about, which is You know what's going to happen? You get all these other people working and then you sit back and you're not working at all. Well, first of all, who wants to be involved in a business that like what business structure supports people that think critically about this for a minute? What business structure supports somebody just sitting back and not working at all ever? I mean, besides besides podcasts. (laughs) That's right. Besides podcasts. Because my feet are up right now and I just, I've got my drink in one hand, microphone in the other, biggest yeah. racket ever. Yeah. Just, yeah. But what type of business supports that? I mean, at least it's either intellectual property, right? Or sweat equity. One of the two that you're going to need to make money. And it's funny, the people that often are telling you that you can sit back and relax. If you look at what they're doing, which are often those people at the top, they're working harder than anybody. I went to one of these deals, you know, I didn't have somebody come to my house, but I had to go somewhere. You know, it was like a friend of a friend said, hey, you know, I got this thing. I think you should be a part of this, like a whatever. So I go and the guy's up there yelling and screaming about how he made a million dollars last week and all this other sort of stuff. And I'm sitting there listening to him. And, you know, I look at my buddy and I'm like, this is such baloney. Here's where I knew he was full of crap because you've been around people that have or make a million dollars. I have been around people that have or make a million dollars. And this was one thing that I can tell you for sure. When they're wearing a suit in public, you know, when you buy your suit at like JCPenney or you go get your suit at Sears, you know, that little tag that's on the sleeve that says like Hagar on the outside, that's like quasi stitched into it. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Yeah. That's not supposed to stay on. That doesn't stay on your suit coat. So for those of you who are at home that are have a like a suit coat that has like the little tag on the outside of the sleeve that says, Hagar, you should cut that off. That's not meant to be there when you wear it out in public. So this guy who told me that he just made a million dollars last week was wearing a suit that had a tag on the outside that he hadn't cut off. Bull crap. Let's get to the heart of his question, though, which is speaking about people with a million dollars. Let me give you a plan for free. Or people that make a million dollars. If I'm somebody that makes a million dollars, what type of advisors do I have around me? Commission-based people who sell you just browbeat you into buying stuff. They'd sell me a free plan and they don't make enough money at their real job that they have to do this part-time. Do I hire somebody who's selling financial products part-time with a free plan? I probably don't hire that type of person if I'm, like, if you want to be wealthy, you do what wealthy people do. You know, Tony Robbins, sometimes Tony Robbins says stuff and I go, okay, but this is a big Tony Robbins thing. If you want to be something You have to start internalizing that, right? You have to act as if. Yes, absolutely. And you find that, I mean, you know, people, Oprah Winfrey talks about the secret, right? The secret is visualize it and it's there. Wayne Dyer. Absolutely. Power of intention. Put this stuff in your life. And I don't see a really wealthy person, if that's what you're after, going, I want my neighbor down the street to come over to my house at 730 after they're done with their real jobs, giving me a free financial plan, which... By the way, let's talk about 
free. If a financial plan is free, there's one of two things going on. Either number one, somebody's incredibly altruistic, which probably isn't the case. The case probably is, is that the free is being subsidized by the products that the plan's going to recommend. Yeah, we call that in marketing parlance, that's a loss leader. Yes. Right? I'm going to give that away for free at a loss, but it's that lead into the relationship. This is my favorite. You know, I'll say this to potential clients when they come in and sit with me. So clients will sit with me and they'll say, but I don't understand why I have to pay you, whatever, $1,500, $2,500, $10,000, whatever the number is. Whatever it is. Yeah. The guy down the street will do it for free. And I say, huh, where did you meet him at? And they say, well, in his office. And I'll say, did he have furniture in the office? Yeah. Did he have a phone? Yeah. Was he dressed? Uh Uh-huh. How do you think he got there? Did he drive? Probably. So all of these things cost money. Did he look to you to the equivalent of Bill Gates or Warren Buffett in terms of his wealth? Well, no. Uh, I wouldn't know. Okay. So either he's doing it, to your point, completely out of the kindness of his heart. And there are people who do that, right? Not a lot of them, but there are. Or he's making money somewhere because he has to put food on his table and he has to pay his electricity bill at his office and he has to put gas in his car and put shoes on his kids just like everybody else. And the thing that frustrates me with that more than anything is how, and I said this before, how disingenuous that really is. You mean uh, how disingenuous the whole free thing is? Yeah. Well, yeah. We had a comment a couple of shows ago from Matt about his financial advisor and, you know, he's charging me commissions and that sort of stuff. Who cares? Man, the guy's got to make money. As long as I'm clear with you as my consumer, as my client, here's how I'm compensated for the advice that I'm sharing with you. And that there's value in that advice. Why do I have to be ashamed of it and say, oh, no, no, this doesn't cost you anything. Bull crap, it costs you something. It's somewhere. (laughs) I mean, and seriously, there's not that many people in the world who give this stuff away for free. And I challenge you to find somebody who really does. But nevertheless, why can't you just say, I'm going to do this financial plan for you. And then it's going to recommend the products that I think we should buy to fill the plan. I'll do the plan for you for free in the hopes that you buy the products that the plan says you need from me. And that's how I make my money. There's nothing wrong with saying that. I can say that all day long. There's no shame in that, right? Why do you have to say, oh, no, the plan's free? Because it's disingenuous. And that's the problem that I have with it. Yeah. And none of that's directly related to any any individual company. I was going to say it's not directly related to Primerica. There might be great Primerica people out there. I don't know. But just generally, when something's offered to me for free and it's a part-time person selling it, it's going to be subsidized with stuff that I probably don't want. Good question. And I know, by the way, just by the way, his question was written that Jason already knows all that. But because he's an Alabama fan, I think we really need to spell that out like a little piece at a time. And Jason, if you need a picture or something because you don't understand how we're putting these words together. I just got (laughs) I love smack doc. This is a great time of year, man. Bowl season. Just fantastic. Game's tomorrow. I know. Good luck to your Alabama team. And see, now I'm being disingenuous, aren't I, when I say that? <laughs> I'm being so... You're like, I actually don't want any luck for them at all. No luck. No, but I hope they get a flat tire on the way to the stadium. <laughs> hope their jerseys don't fit right. All sorts of problems. Right. If a guy gets hurt, I hope he's not hurt forever. But if... But for if, the game. That's yeah, but hurt. if... The, if it, not going to hurt your feelings. If your Heisman Award winning... Running back, you know, sprains his ankle. So it's not permanent, but just for that game, I will. He has a cold. Yes, absolutely. I, I don't want any permanent damage, but any little but bit a of cold would be acceptable. Would be great. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for the questions, everybody, this year. It's been a fantastic year of questions from everybody. If you've got questions for us, send those to joe at stackingbenjamins.com. Another great way to start the new year, our partner, Kathleen, and I have been going on a tour talking about Save 50 course. It's save50.org. If you want to head that way, if you want to start off 2016 by saving half of your income, Kathleen's already lived that before. So she's the driving force in that project. Pretty cool stuff. That's save50.org if you want to do that in early 2016. Also, you can get OG and I with our Stacking 101 Benjamins course. We really do got to figure out, OG, when we're going to do this thing live again. We said we were going to do it in January, but we have done nothing to make that happen. So, but if you want us live via on your own time, it's stackingbenjamins.com forward slash 101. And that'll take you right to the Stacking 101 Benjamins course. So a couple of courses to start your new year off right. People are nice enough to review the show, but please leave us a review wherever you listen. This one's going on Mom's Refrigerator. Five stars from Wings on Water 3. Wings on Water. That's quite a name. 
that's like their Native American name, right? Wings on Water, Dances with Wolves, that kind of thing. <laughs> Wings on Water says, I've only recently begun to learn about personal finance and investing. This is one of my favorite shows to listen to. I know when I listen to it, I'll always learn something new that I can apply to my financial plan. Well, that's disappointing, isn't it, OG? Somebody's learning something. This is not the show that you go to to learn stuff. The show's production is very professional. The interviews are solid, and I enjoy listening to OG's advice and perspective on investing. Thanks for helping us newbies out, guys, and keep up the great work. Thanks, Wings on Water. See how easy that is? Wings on Water took just a second. It helps the show. It helps us find new listeners. And because we're not marketing, we're working hard on always making the show better. Thanks a ton. It's not just a wrap on this show, man. This is a wrap on this year. 2015 down, huh? Can you believe the show lasted the entire year? Who knew we'd still be here? It's crazy. What's your big plan for 2016? Oh, I have a big plan, but I can't tell anybody. You'll have to kill us. You could tell us, but you'd have to kill us. I'm going to go on vacation, and then I'll come back from that vacation and try to go on another vacation. That's the key. Mm -hmm. My plan for 2016 is... I'm going to get back into, you know, I didn't run a marathon in 2015, so I'm going to get back into that again, run maybe a couple marathons in 2016. Oh, just a couple. Just a couple. Yeah. You and I have been talking a little bit that I got to stop eating mom's cookies. So it's time for me to lose a little bit of weight, get back into fighting weight, OG. Yeah, right. Me too. <laughs> going, to be, going to be fun. Great time to talk about this, by the way, while the holiday party is going on upstairs. See, my problem isn't the cookies, it's the copious amounts of apple juice. Yeah. <laughs> Adult flavored apple juice. Yes. Right, right. Hey, thanks to everybody for sticking with us through 2015. The show obviously wouldn't go without you. And wherever you're at, I hope you and yours have a fantastic New Year's. Be safe out there on New Year's, everybody. And we'll see you back next year on Friday. Friday, the round table will be here with the New Year's Day episode, looking back into Lens Magic 8-Ball. Were all of the things that we predicted in 2015 correct? We'll see with Len and Paula and Greg on Friday. Then next week, fantastic lineup OG next week of guests. We're going to kick off New Year's in just a fabulous fashion. On Monday, Dr. Willie Jolly's here. And if you don't know who Dr. Willie Jolly is, you know those Big stadium tours, OG, those motivational tours that go around the country. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Les Brown. And it used to be like Zieg Ziegler on that tour. Well, when Zieg Ziegler passed away, Dr. Willie Jolly took his Zieg Ziegler's place. He was tapped to go into that tour. And Dr. Willie Jolly, Turn Your Setbacks into Greenbacks is his book. And I'm so excited to talk to him about getting the right attitude as you kick off 2016. That's going to be that you cannot be motivated. When you talk Love to it. Dr. Willie Jolly. And then yeah. on Wednesday, one of my all-time favorite columnists, I have just love this woman's writing, Jane Bryant Quinn coming down to the basement. You like Jane Bryant Quinn. It's pretty awesome. Jane Bryant Quinn, of course, with Newsweek, but you've seen her in USA. You've seen Jane Bryant Quinn all over the place. She has a new book coming out next week, How to Make Your Money Last, The Indispensable Retirement Guide. We get to talk to Jane Bryant Quinn. What a great, great way to start next year. We'll see everybody back here in 2016. Stack more Benjamins. This show is the property of the Free Financial Advisor, LLC. Copyright 2015. This show was edited by Joe Salcihai and Isabella Bianca. Special thanks to CBS's Jill Schlesinger for partying with us in the basement today. You'll find her show Jill on Money at JillOnMoney.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. And thanks to all of our listeners for making this a great year. I love being the voice that brings you the world's best information every week. I'm sorry that you have to sit through all that nonsense from Joe and OG in between my segments, though. But let's just say they're a necessary evil. Special no thanks to Joe's mom for failing to inform me that the punch didn't just taste like mop water, it was mop water. Looks like in about an hour I'm going to start my cleansing for the new year. Have a safe new year and we'll see you back here in 2016 for more Stacking Benjamins.
it's our last after show of 2015, and I got nothing. Hmm. You know what we should talk about? We should talk about New Year's Eve parties because there have been some memorable New Year's Eve parties in my past. We had a New Year's Eve party a couple of years ago where we just had a few friends over and we played one of those murder mysteries. Have you ever done those murder mysteries? Have not. No. But you know what I'm talking about where everybody kind of gets a roll and, you know, there were eight of us. And what a great way to end the year, by the way. It was a blast. If you've never done these murder mystery parties, they're fantastic. But my friend Rob is always that guy at every party. You know, every group of friends has that guy. And you'll say that if you don't have that guy in your group, then you're that guy. You're that guy. Yeah. Yeah. So we make it through the evening and this particular murder mystery, it's in three acts. So you do the first part. And by the way, you have no idea if you've never done a murder mystery, here's how it works. You get this booklet and you open it up and you find out that somebody died and now you're all characters and the cops have left you in this room. And before the cops actually show up, you're going to talk to each other and kind of go through events. And everybody, OG, starts off in this thing as somebody who is, you know, guiltless, faultless. They're fantastic. Like, I opened it up at this murder mystery party. I'm this successful businessman. I'm actually married in the game. I'm married to my buddy's wife who's sitting across the room, so that was kind of weird. But I'm a great guy. But it turns out, during the first act, you learn things about other characters, and there's some things that you learn about yourself that you're trying to cover up, right? So then... You just say go and everybody is in character and you just start pointing out dirt on other characters. And it's funny because it starts building this, what really happened, right? Here's what we think happened and here's what really happened. Turns out my wife is not happy with me. Thank God my buddy's wife isn't very happy with me being pretend husband. And it also turns out that I've been embezzling money from the company that I work for and I've been trying to cover it up. And then you stop, you take a break, and then you have a second act, and then you have a third act. And during those three acts, OG, you get slimier and slimier, right? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Like by the end, by the end, not only do I think I could have killed the person, everybody in the room could have killed the person. It could have been any of us, usually with like only one or two exceptions. do Do you know like early on if you're the guy who did it? You don't know. No, you don't know. You don't know if you did it or not. I gotcha. And they tell you, do not look ahead in the book because at the back of the book, it's going to tell you what really happened. And so it's kind of cool how it works, too, because at the end, they tell you to have dessert. So it's just before New Year's. You know, we had it all planned out, the timeline. And it's maybe 20 minutes before the ball's going to drop. So we all go to the dining room. We're sitting around. We get some dessert. And it tells you before you start reading what happened. And you open up your book and it gives you a number like one through eight. And they have you go around the room and read a piece at a time. And you slowly learn who did it, right? And it's this really cool climactic ending. We've done a few of them, but none of my group of friends here in Texarkana had ever done these. And so I said, okay, we're going to do the final thing here in a second, which is really neat. But why don't we talk about who you think did it? So it says in the book, you should like point to somebody and say that you thought. So I said, I'll start. I think that so-and-so did it. And it's the woman I'm supposedly married to. I said, I think she did it because of da-da-da and this other thing. And then the guy next to me says, well, I think that somebody else across the room did it because of, you know, they were doing all this bad stuff on the side and the fact that they were a little nervous when they came out of the room with the body in it. You know, they're the first one to see the body, so they probably did it. And then it's Rob's turn. And Rob says, I did it. (laughs) And I said, no, Rob, you know, this is the part of the game where you like, you know, point to somebody else, even if you think you did it. He goes, oh, no, no, no. I just went to the bathroom. I took my book with me. I totally did it. <laughs> nice. Like jerk face. We're all <laughs> supposed to guess, man. <laughs> he totally ruins the end of the night. This is like, I don't know. This is maybe three years ago. And we still talk about what a <laughs> Rob is. Just no, no, no. I did it, man. I'm going to totally end this game early. I don't know if Rob was bored or what. What kind of New Year's stuff have you done? We usually just have one couple over. We started this years ago. We had one couple and then finally expanded it to two, two couples and their kids. And then that was our thing. And then one of my friends announced at, I don't know, Thanksgiving or something like that, that he was having New Year's Eve at his house. Huh? Yeah. Oh, so I, I remember kinda, this. This is last I year, I looked right? at him like, what? What the hell are you talking about? No, you're not. My wife's like, oh, we got to go. I'm like, I'm not going. I do New Year's Eve at my house. This has been your thing forever. Yeah, this was last year was the first time this this was 
No, this is several years ago. Oh. But because last year we kind of moved, so we didn't really. Oh, that's it. right. Yeah. But, uh, last year we celebrated New Year's twice. We were in the Eastern time zone and celebrated it. And then we were flying and crossed into the Central time zone. And I forgot that you were in the air. And then uh, celebrated it again. Oh, yeah. That was fantastic. There's a whole day of travel, right? And my kids are exhausted. And we're sitting on this plane, not in first class, like row flipping 20 or something. And it's like a thousand degrees on the plane. And it's packed with people from, we had to take a, have a connection. So we're in Atlanta. It's packed with people who raced there from the bowl game that was in Atlanta, the Peach Bowl. Oh, no. So they're hammered, they're sloppy, they're, they're exhausted because they've been up since, you know, whatever time. And we're just crammed in there and we're like trying to get the kids to go to sleep because it's 1130 at night. And it's loud. Well, it's a plane. It's a loud plane. Like people weren't being obnoxious, but a ton, but it was hot. Like the air conditioning didn't work. So it was oh, like yeah, yeah. a thousand degrees, 10 minutes before we're scheduled to land. I look over at my kids and they're asleep. They finally fell asleep. Have you ever fallen asleep and had to wake up 10 minutes later? Oh. Like, how do you feel when that happens? Oh, I'm so angry. <laughs> how do you think a seven-year-old feels when that happens? I'm angry without a filter. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm schlepping a week and a half worth of gear through the airport, hanging onto a kid, carrying another kid. I got car seats. I got pack and plays. I got suitcases, children. Oh, it was like. It was like I just climbed Kilimanjaro when I got to the outside. Because then the airport was hot, too. It was unseasonably warm where we were flying. So, you know, they had the heat on and it was Ugh. hot inside and it was a long walk. And it's 12, 15 in the morning. And Was there any three, two, one at any point, though? Oh, no. Was no. there any Happy New Year or it just happened? It just happened. Yeah. yeah. You know, you do these things. You do things one time and you go, well, <laughs> never again am I going to do that. So I learned I'm never flying at night with my children. I just, you know, because you look at sometimes you buy tickets, right? Especially this, New Year's Eve. Yeah. Well, see, this is the problem. People look at the price and then they don't think through it. Right. You know, they say, oh, well, this ticket's $300 and this ticket's $350. And you go, oh, well, I'm going to take $300 one. Well, the $300 one, you have to be to the airport at 515 in the morning and you fly home at 1215 at night. And you have a six hour layover. Yeah. And you got some crappy deal. You got to really dissect that and think about, okay, I got to buy four tickets. That's $200. I get that. That's some money. But. If I took the nine o'clock flight, I could sleep until 630 or seven, like a normal day, go to the airport, ease into the day. I come home at four o'clock in the afternoon. We're home. The whole cost benefit analysis. Oh, totally. And then you got to evaluate row 21 versus row three. So that was the other thing that I, that was the day. I take row 21 every time. Yeah, I know. Yeah. You don't have little children. I get to know new people. The only time I, it was creepy was that time I told you about back in November when the dude fell asleep and he was like starting to put his head on my shoulder. And I was like, uh, that's, that's a little awkward. Well, as long as he didn't put his tongue in your ear, I think yeah. it's probably okay. <laughs> Speaking of tongues and ears, I got to go. The old lady's ready to call tonight. All right, man. Everybody happy have a new year. Amen, brother. Happy new year to you.